You know, we started a little tradition in my family with my two oldest granddaughters many years ago when they were quite young. As they would begin loading up in the car from a visit with us, they were probably only six months old, the youngest one, we started a little ritual. As they were being buckled in the car safely and secure, we would begin saying to them, some words that they thought were cute and funny to begin with. We would just say, see you later, alligator. And they thought it was so cute and so funny as they got old enough to understand that. Eventually, we started adding more things to the saying. So before long, as they began to talk better, the ritual changed. We would start the phrase, and then they would end it. So we would say, see you later, and they would respond, alligator. And this was kind of a ritual. So if you were a neighbor of ours and were watching us, as they began to back out of the driveway, you would see this ritual or hear this ritual. We would say, see you later, and they would come back, alligator. And we would say, after a while, and they'd say, crocodile. And we'd say, see you soon, and they'd say, baboon. <laughs> In time, we added some quotes from the Princess Bride, which many of you remember. So we would say, have fun, and they'd say, storming the castle. It's kind of like, OK, that's your week. As you go forward, let's do a lot of stuff, good stuff. And then we would end it with, do you think it'll work? And they would say, it'll take a miracle. <laughs> and then we'd say, bye bye. I love you, and they would take off. Now they've grown up, they're teenagers. We don't do that very often anymore, but every now and then it'll actually start up and we'll actually go through the routine. But it left an indelible mark in memory and in my life that these children were miracles and life itself was a miracle. You know, the Bible is a record of lives filled with miracles. If you think about it, you can think of many miracles in the Bible. Water coming out of solid rock, manna falling from heaven and feeding Israel, lions' mouths closed while Daniel slept. These all were meant for a point in time and for specific reasons. You know, the Naves Topical Bible says that Christ performed, or there's recorded in the Bible in New Testament, 34 miracles. Now, I'm sure Christ performed many more than that. Because John 21, 25 says, and there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that they would be written in. You know, we often think or sometimes think or hear the quote that maybe miracles are for, quote, Bible times or for like extraordinary times. And they really don't happen that much today. But, you know, God's working miracles in our everyday life. You know, if we sat down and talked to each other, I'm sure we could tell each other many stories, fascinating stories of miracles that have occurred in our life. Life is filled with miracles. So I'd like to take a look at some of those that we have in our lives today. You know, first of all, what is a miracle? Well, according to dictionary.com, a miracle is a wonder or a marvel or a miracle is such an event or an effect manifesting or considered as a work of God. Or a third definition is an event or extraordinary event in the physical world that surpasses all known human or natural powers and is ascribed to a supernatural cause. We see that one of the terms that's used for a miracle is supernatural. Well, if you take the Latin words for supernatural, the roots mean above nature. Supernatural means something that is above or outside of nature. It's not part of this physical world and its normal laws. It's outside of it. 
You know, God's miracles are supernatural because they originate with God, who is outside of this physical world. Outside of the physical, he lives in a different realm. So I'd like to take a look today of four miracles that we have in our lives today. Four miracles that we enjoy in our everyday life. Now, the first miracle we'll share actually is shared by everybody or everything in physical existence that is alive. The other miracles pertain to us now in this time, but they will in time come to everybody else. I'm going to talk about four. There are many other miracles that we can think of. And can you really categorize miracles as greater or lesser? I mean, they're all miracles. So, but I'm, I've taken four that I see in my life and in our lives that I tried to focus on a little bit during this time. You know, as we look at miracles, it's especially helpful to us to look at the power and the glory and the love and the care that God has as he shows us these things through his miracles. You know, turn with me to John 1. John 1. Let's take a look at the first great miracle I want to talk about today. John 1, beginning in verse 1. We'll go through verse 4. John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Now, to be honest, I don't know if you can call this a miracle or not. In the beginning or as a beginning, there were two beings, nothing else. Nothing else. That was it. And they had lived forever in the past. They were never created. Uh, it's pretty hard to really even comprehend that. You know, because human life in this physical universe is really just a series of beginnings and endings. You know, we as, as human beings, we, we're born, we grow up, we produce the next generation, we're productive, we grow old, we die, another generation takes over. Mountains rise up, worn away, wash into the sea. Spring, summer, winter, fall. Life, physical life, is a cycle. Beginnings and endings. But here we have two beings that have never had and never will have a beginning or an ending. That's a miracle, if you'd ask me. But these are the beings that were there from the very beginning. They are definitely outside of this physical world. You know, but this isn't the miracle I want to focus on. Let's look at verse 3. All things were made through him, talking of the word. And without him, nothing was made that was made. Verse 4, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light of men. This is the first great miracle as I see it. It's the miracle of creation and life that came from it. Creation and life that came from it. Creation is a miracle. The word who later became Jesus Christ created everything. Everything that we can see around us and so many things we can't see. He created them all. Psalms 33 talks about this, the recording of the creation of the universe. Psalms 33, beginning in verse 6. These verses in Psalms show this incredible power of the word as he created and brought forth this universe into existence. Psalms 33 Verse 6, I'm going to read from the New Living Translation. The Lord merely spoke, and the heavens were created. He breathed the word, and all the stars were born. He assigned the sea its boundaries and locked the oceans in vast reservoirs. Verse 8, let the whole world fear the Lord, and let everyone stand in awe of him. For when he spoke, the world began it appeared at his command. 
You know what power we see there, supernatural, supernatural occurrence. You know, how exactly did this happen? Well, we don't, we don't know exactly how this occurred, but we do know it says here, the Lord spoke and these things were created. At some point in the past, God said, let there be stars and galaxies and atoms and quarks. Let them exist and it came out of nothing other than spirit. It came from that. You know, God, science has some clues. It can give us clues as to how this might have occurred, but they don't know for sure. And they still can't effectively explain how something can come from nothing. But this creation is perfect. Consider this marvelous universe. You know, we've got this sun that blazes in all of its glory. All this light and power and it's perfectly placed for human life on this earth. Too closer, too hot. We wouldn't be able to live as we do now. Too far away and it would be too cold. And it's tilted at just the right angle for seasons and to help moderate the earth's climate. God designed this incredible miracle of the universe Perfectly, perfectly. Then what? Was that the end of his creation? Is that it? This beautiful planets and stars and universe? No, God had a plan. He had a plan. Everything you see around here wasn't created just for God to enjoy its beauty. Though it is beautiful, he had a plan to expand his family. He wanted to expand his family, and that was the purpose of this creation of the universe, was to reproduce himself and to bring children into his family. We can read about that phase if we turn to Genesis 2. That phase of this creation in Genesis 2. In Genesis 2, we see the creation of humankind beginning with Adam and then the giving of life to him talking about this time of maybe remodeling of this earth as it had been perfectly created at one point and then became waste. We see that in Genesis 1. But in Genesis 2, beginning in verse 1, we read, Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day, from all his work which he had done. So he recreated this earth, made it habitable. Then if we drop down to verse seven, we see, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being. As part of this creation or recreation of this earth, God created humankind, man and then later women, and gave them the breath of life. He caused life to enter into them, caused them to become living. And that's the second part to this miracle, this creation miracles. God created man and later woman and then gave them life, an incredible miracle. You know, Paul tells Timothy in 1 Timothy 6.13, he says, I urge you in the sight of God who gives life to all things. God is the author of life, the giver of life, the miracle of life. Turn with me to Nehemiah 9. It's got some interesting verses about this mir miracle of creation and life. You know, let's see, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah. It goes back to the days when I had to teach my kids for uh, YES or, or uh, youth classes and going through the, verse, or the books of the Bible. Nehemiah 9, beginning in verse 6, which connects this creation and life. We see, 
You alone are the Lord. You have made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their hosts, the earth and everything on it, the seas and all that is in them. So this is that first part, the miracle of creation. It's attributed to the Lord. He created it all. And then the next sentence, still part of this verse, we see the miracle of life. And you preserve them all. Now, many translations of the Bible actually translate this, and you preserve them all, as you give life to all of them. You give life to all of them. God created, and then he gave life. He created, and then he gave life, the miracle of life. And we can read a little bit further on here. We see what the outcome of this is. The host of heaven worships you. So the angelic realm praised and worshiped God because of what they saw with this creation of the universe and the giving of life. So God created everything, everything that we see, and he created humankind, and he breathed life into these lifeless bodies that they had to make them live. And we are living, breathing creations of God, miracles. And that lets us transition into the next miracle that we enjoy. We enjoy God's calling, the miracle of God's calling. I don't know how many of you remember sea monkeys. Some of you older people might um, you can actually find them on Amazon, and you can find them in various stores. But as a kid, I used to turn back to, to the back of my Poplar Science or Poplar Mechanics magazine, and there was always this advertisement. And it had usually this boy, young boy, and this young girl, and they were looking into this little aquarium. And this little aquarium had little families and they were doing acrobatics, and they were, you know, um, doing family things together, dancing, it looked like, and hugging. And I thought, wow, I've got to get something like this to actually be able to watch these things dance and do acrobatics and things like that, swimming around. I bought one once, got it, waited, anticipated, finally got it, opened it up put water into the little aquarium, took out the little bag, opened it up, poured it into the aquarium, waited three or four days. And to my surprise, all they were was little brine shrimp that just fluttered around and did nothing at all. No families, no acrobatics, no dancing, no bedtime stories. I quickly grew tired of them and threw it out. You know, God did not create this physical universe, the sun, the earth, and man and woman, to just watch them like little sea monkeys. He created them for a purpose. He created them for a calling. You know, otherwise, God would have probably grown tired of us like I grew tired of those sea monkeys. But God has not grown tired of us. God created mankind for a purpose, for a calling, to eventually give us a chance to become part of his family. He called us for a reason. And that's that second great miracle God performs in our life today, the miracle of God's calling. We have the miracle of God's calling. God's calling us now. It's a unique miracle. It's directly from God the Father and specifically to you. It's just for a small group of us at this time, but God wants to call many more in the future. We are the first fruits for a special part of his plan. We're the first fruits to enter into his spiritual family. And God's calling is very personal. It's a personal invitation to have a close relationship 
with him. Now, he wants to have that close relationship with all humanity eventually. God wants all humanity be to, be, to be part of his family. And let's turn to Romans 8, 28. We read this often, especially when we need encouraging, because it is a very encouraging scripture. It tells us that everything will work out for the good. But what I'd like to focus on is actually the second part of that today, to look at who is encouraged, who that encouragement is given to. Romans 8, 28, and it says, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are, and this is the part I want to focus on, to those who are the called according to his purpose, according to this purpose that God has for us, that he's working out here on this earth. God has called us, and he's called us according to that purpose, according to that plan that he created. And in verse 29, we can see what that purpose is, or at least part of that purpose. Verse 29, it says, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Verse 30, Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. We're called for a special purpose. That special purpose came from the very beginning and even before the beginning of the creation, that first miracle I talked about. That what came before life entered into man, into Adam and into Eve, to be forerunners and first fruits as part of his plan. We are called according to a purpose, to be in his family, to be glorified. He predestined or decided in advance that a small group of people would be called to resist the poles of Satan in this world and eventually glorify them and turn them into spirit beings. I'd like to read these scriptures in the New Century Version. It reads as follows. We know that in everything God works for the good of those who love him. They are the people he called because that was his plan. God knew them before he made the world, and he chose them to be like his son so that Jesus would be the firstborn of many brothers and sisters. Verse 30, God planned for them to be like his son, and those he planned to be like his son, he also called. And those he called, he also made right with him. And those he made right, he also glorified. You know, this word translated called in these verses actually comes from two different Greek words, both of which can be translated called out or called, but they can also be translated as to bid or invite. Here is the miracle. God has invited you. God has invited you to something wonderful, to a plan that he wants to work with you to fulfill, to have a special relationship with you. You've been chosen by God according to that plan. You know, that calling begins with a literal miracle by God. He reaches down and selects you. He selects me to start working with individually. God the Father, a spiritual being, reached down into this physical world, into our physical lives, and called us. No matter how hard we try, we can't choose to be called. You can't decide to be called. You can't twist God's arm and force him to call you. You really can't even seek to be called. I guess you can seek to be called, but unless God himself decides that it's you, it's not your time. Your calling will come later. 
Verse 30, which we just read, it says, God planned for them to be like his son, and those he planned to be like his son, he also called, and those he called. Well, let's stop right there. Who does the, the calling? Well, we can see it's the Father. It's the Father who does the calling. God the Father does the calling. Let's turn over to John 6, 44. We read these scriptures often during the time before and during Passover. In this section of scripture, Jesus is telling the Jews that he's the true bread of life. And the Jews found this very hard to understand and in fact were complaining and murmuring about it. But here again he tells us who does the calling. John 6, 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. 45, it is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. We see again, it's the Father who does the calling, who does the supernatural miracle with us. He's the one who looks down and uniquely chose you. No one can come to the Jesus Christ unless the Father draws them. You know, the Greek word used here for draws, and unless the Father who sent me draws him, has a connotation of to drag or to pull, to draw, to persuade, to lead, to impel. It isn't just an invitation. It isn't like just sending out an invitation and say, hey, if you got the time, you know, come join us. It's more than that. It's not just a simple request. It's more powerful than that. It's a pull. He desires, if he calls you, he desires you. He's drawing you towards him and into this relationship. He's thought it through. He's made a decision that you're somebody he wants to be called at this time. It's more active than an invitation. He's drawing you into relationship with him and the Son. Let's drop down to verse 65. Because you see, again, Jesus reiterates the concept that the Father is the one who does the choosing of who is called. John 6, 65. And he said, therefore, I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my father. The father, again, we see, does the calling, a personal calling to be part of his first fruits. Now it's up to us whether we accept that a calling or not. We've got to make that decision whether we want to move forward on that calling that God has done, that drawing that God has done. Let's move on to the next miracle I want to talk about then. So we've talked about creation and the miracle of life. We've talked about the miracle of God's calling. Let's now talk about the miracle of the gift of the Holy Spirit. The miracle of the gift of the Holy Spirit. Turn with me to Acts 2, 38 and 39. Acts 2, 38 and 39 connects the miracle of our calling with the miracle of the receiving or the giving of the gift of the Holy Spirit. Acts 2, beginning in verse 38. Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. So God has to call you, begin working with you, before you can even begin the process of receiving the miracle of the gift of the Holy Spirit. When God performs that miracle of that calling, 
you've got to make the decision of whether you want to accept that calling and whether you want to receive the Holy Spirit. It's only going to happen if you repent and if you're baptized, if you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, that you'll actually receive the supernatural gift of the Holy Spirit. Let's quickly just take a look at what the Holy Spirit, what it does for us, this miracle. Because the gift of the Holy Spirit performs miracles within us, within our lives. It should change over time as it works with us and as we work with it and yield to it. It should change our lives. It should change how we act. It should change how we view other people, how we treat others, how we view our neighbor, how we view our wife, our children, our parents, our neighbors. It even changes the purpose of our lives. It truly is life-changing as we yield to the Holy Spirit. In 2 Corinthians 3, we can see how it does this, how this transformation takes place. I'm going to read this in the New Living Translation again. It's a little bit easier to understand. 2 Corinthians 3, beginning in verse 3. And we'll read through verse 6. Clearly, you are a letter from Christ showing the result of our ministry among you. This letter is written not with pen and ink. In other words, our Christian lives aren't ruled by a list of rules that we only refer to from time to time. But with the spirit of the living God, it is carved not on tablets of stone, but on human hearts. We are confident of all this because of our great trust in God through Christ. Verse 5, it is not that we think we are qualified to do anything on our own. Our qualification comes from God. Verse 6, he has enabled us to be ministers of his new covenant. This is a covenant not, written, not of written laws, but of the Spirit. The old written covenant ends in death, but under the new covenant, the Spirit gives life. The Holy Spirit gives life not death. It changes us. Our hearts become more receptive. With the Holy Spirit, we don't just live by a set of rules and laws, though we keep them because we realize that that shows love. But it isn't just a set of laws written on paper. It's a set of laws written in our hearts. And that can only come from the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. That is the only way that we can incorporate them within us and change, allow the Holy Spirit to change us. You know, with the help of the Holy Spirit, God's way of life becomes part of our very spiritual DNA. We've all heard of gene splicing, physical gene splicing, where they splice genes into plants or microbes or into various other things to benefit man in various ways. You know, when God gives us his Holy Spirit, in many ways, he's doing spiritual gene splicing. He's splicing part of his nature into us to benefit us in our spiritual lives, to become more like him and to become a different person. You know, for humans to be changed and to be led by God's Holy Spirit is one of the greatest miracles. You know, we can see that miracle in the life of Paul in Galatians 2.20. Galatians 2.20, where it says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. This is the miracle of the Holy Spirit in full bloom. Christ living in us through the Holy Spirit. You know, this great miracle of the gift of the Holy Spirit leads us to the fourth miracle I want to talk about today, the fourth miracle in our life. The fourth miracle is the miracle of becoming a son or daughter of God. 
the miracle of becoming a son or daughter of God. The gift of the Holy Spirit seals us with a promise that if we run the race to the end, we are guaranteed to receive the prize. And that prize is in the form of an inheritance from God. Let's look at Ephesians 1. Let's take a look at this. Ephesians 1, verse 13. We'll see the seal of the Holy Spirit, this miracle of the gift of the Holy Spirit, and what that promises us. Ephesians 1, beginning in verse 13. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Verse 14, which is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. When God puts his Holy Spirit in us, we receive the guarantee that he has an inheritance for us, that we have a gift of an inheritance. As long as we continue in his way, the Holy Spirit seals us with assurance of that gift, that we'll be born into the very family as a spirit-born child of God. This is who we are. If you're yielding to the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, if you've been called, you're benefactors of the great God, of your Father, and your inheritance is awaiting for you, waiting you. Romans 8. Let's take a look at what this inheritance is, or part of this inheritance. Romans 8, verse 12. Romans 8, verse 12. It says, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit, this miracle of the Holy Spirit, you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father, Verse 16, the Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And then verse 17, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint, joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, and we may also be glorified together. This is the great miracle that God looks on us as children now if we have the Holy Spirit in him, if we are doing what he has asked us to do, if he has called us, he already looks at us as children and as heirs of him, heirs of his family, heirs that will be glorified together. And because God gave humankind or created humankind and gave us physical life, and because God called us and because God gave us the Holy Spirit, we've got an amazing inheritance. And we need to just live by the Holy Spirit and put the deeds of the flesh to death. You know, if we look at this verse as we read in Romans 8, we can see that we will, live, we will have a life eternal. We are sons and daughters of God. We can call him Father. We are not in bondage. Being children, we are heirs of God. And we will be glorified together. These are all part of that fourth miracle the miracle that we've got yet in the future and is still and is here now today as sons and daughters of God our Father in heaven. And God desires to bring many to glory. He's just starting with us now. In Hebrews 2, 11, 10 and 11, we see that God is trying or does want to bring many sons and daughters to glory. Hebrews 2, 10 and 11 says, For it is fitting for him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Verse 11, for both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. 
This is a phenomenal end result of these miracles God's performing in our lives to become sons and daughters of God the Father and to live forever as his glorified children. Forever. What a miracle. You know, the second book of Peter was written close to the end of the author's life. In the first uh, chapter of Peter, and we will read the first four verses, in the first chapter, Peter writes about our life, our calling, the Holy Spirit, and our ultimate future. All four miracles that we talked about, all relevant to us today. Second Peter, verse 1. Peter wraps all these miracles together in these verses. Verse 1, Second Peter, chapter 1. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have attained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power, the miracle of receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life, the miracle of life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us, the miracle of God's calling, to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, the fourth miracle, becoming a son or daughter of God, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. And then if we drop down to verse 10, we read, Therefore, brothers and sisters, be all the more diligent to make your calling and election sure. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fail. For in this way there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We are now today becoming sons and daughters of God. What a wonderful thing it'll be when we change into divine nature of God in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump to be part of his divine family as sons and daughters, spiritual sons and daughters of God the Father. And we'll inherit the kingdom of heaven. You know, we may say that no miracles are happening today, but it just isn't true. We're walking, talking, living, breathing miracles. They happen every minute of our lives. God is performing miracles. First, life as we know it is a miracle. Life bursts forth out of nothing. God created it all. All that there is, including physical life, when there was nothing at all, a supernatural miracle. Second, God's calling is a miracle. Even the thought that he knows me personally to me is a miracle. Third, God's gift of the Holy Spirit is a miracle. It's incredible that God gives, wants to give me and you such a great gift that he wants to be part of who we are. He wants to live within us. And fourth, the life that God has waiting for us as we complete the journey of this whole set of miracles to be changed into a spirit being, a son or daughter of God the Father in a twinkling of an eye, physical to spirit, that's a miracle. To inherit the everlasting kingdom, what an incredible miracle. To never, ever, ever cease from existence to never die, to always be in happiness. What a future. What an incredible future. You know, life has its difficulties. It has its challenges. We find ourselves from time to time in the midst of difficulties. But you know, God reminds us on a daily basis that he's still doing miracles you know, as the sun rises and it sets, 
It's a miracle. As you talk to God in prayer, as God moves you with his Holy Spirit, as you're dazzled by the rainbow after a summer storm, God reminds us that miracles still exist. You know, and God can fulfill these miracles in you. Let's look at that in Philippians 1. Philippians 1, I'm going to read this again in the New Living Translation. It's our last scripture, Philippians 1, verse 6. God can and will fulfill the destiny of you becoming a spiritual child and entering into the kingdom of God if we do what we need to do. Philippians 1, verse 6. And I am certain, Paul is confident, as the New King James Version says, and I am certain that God, who began a good work within you through creating this universe and giving you physical life and then calling you and then giving you his Holy Spirit, that he will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Jesus Christ returns. Paul is confident that God can perform it. He can perform all the miracles that he has done, has performed, is performing, and will perform in the future. He will change you into spirit, and you will inherit the kingdom of God. You know, let's go back to the very beginning of this message. Remember the ritual my granddaughters and my wife and I had as we were leaving home, or as they were leaving home? Do you remember what the last line was? Do you think it'll work? And their reply was, it'll take a miracle. It'll take a miracle. Thankfully, God is performing miracles in our life right now. Our lives are a reminder that God is in the business of miracles.